Thank you, Peter. Uh, my name is Jason Swedlow. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you to, I think someone said this is the 17th OME, um, meeting of the OME user community. I lost count a long, long time ago. Um, it's great to see you all here. Um, talk a little bit about the virtual meetings um, approach um, uh, here in a second, but just thank you for joining us. Um, you'll have seen that there's a couple of meetings. We're trying to run these meetings early in the morning UK time and late in the afternoon UK time, hopefully to capture as, as wide a um, um, community as possible. Um, so it's my job to um, uh, introduce the meeting and then um, give you an update of where we are with um, ONE. And then I'm going to hand over my colleagues at Glencoe Software are going to give you an update of what they've been doing and then um, uh, talk about work they've um, on, um, ongoing work that they're looking forward to. Um, and um, I will, um, the OME part will be uh, split between myself and Francis Wong, who will tell you about our work on the image data resource. So um, hopefully uh, you can all see that. Let me just get all of the windows. Um, um, uh, open here. Um, it's great to see so many familiar faces. I'm sorry we couldn't welcome you all to Dundee at this time. I'm sure it would be an awful lot of fun. Um, hopefully sometime in the future. Okay, um, so uh, without further ado, um, just a quick uh, Zoom etiquette before we get started. This is mostly just copying the notes that you've seen in the portal document. The URL for the portal document is at the bottom of the slide. That provides all of the information um, on the meeting. I presume most of you have seen that since you got to this call, um, but just in case um, that link is there. So we've all done this too many times over the last couple of years, but just to refresh, um, um your memory um if you can please edit your um uh your full name um and if you can your uh, affiliation uh in the um within the zoom participants window that'll help um that helps people see who you are um uh obviously mute yourself when not presenting or asking a question uh the chat window is open please drop any questions there um I'm happy we'll just try to pick them up as quickly as possible. Um, if you want to if you want to um, ask a question um, verbally, just raise your hand and we'll try to pick that up. Um, any te technical difficulties, um, use the chat box. You can email training support um, at the email address at the bottom of the slide. Probably the most important thing to say is just to remind you all that these um, that this um, session is being recorded. Um, uh, so, and that record that the recording will be uh, posted on YouTube. Um, for those of you who use uh, uh, private chats to individuals, that's um, absolutely fine. I but just remember that the um, the Zoom chats, um, you know, as the owner of the call, which in this case is um, uh, the training support user, effectively OME, uh, can see those private chats. So comments like. You know, Swedlow's getting a little bit old and gray and kind of um, crusty. You know, you know, you know, he used to look a lot younger. Things like that. Those are all fine and probably true, but um, just know that will be um, uh, those those comments will be visible. Um, okay, um, just to give you an idea um, an idea of how this meeting is going to run over the next um, couple of days, we have um, four sessions running on Tuesday and Thursday of this week and Tuesday and Thursday of next week. Um, today, we really wanted to give um, our community an update on um, what we've been doing on OME and um, what Glencoe Software has been doing. So that'll be the focus of today's meeting. Um, and then the next three sessions on the on Thursday on the 10th and next Tuesday and Thursday will be um, more focused on, um, on, uh, um, on, disc on discussing specific aspects of NGFF. First of all, viewers for NGFF on Thursday um metadata next tuesday and um uh trying to s sort out this rather 
vexing problem of support um, support for OMIZAR and Java. And just to remind you, we're trying to reach as broad a, um, a um, range of the community as possible. So running more or less the same uh, presentations and discussions twice each of those days, one at 8 a.m., starting at 8 a.m. Uh, GMT, and one starting at 4 p.m. GMT, we'll assume that you can figure out um, your, your own relationship to um, a Greenwich Mean Time. Okay, um, hopefully that's all clear. Obviously, any questions, just drop them in the chat. Um, so um, just to address this question, why are we doing a virtual meeting? Why aren't you all here in Dundee enjoying, enjoying a lovely sunset? Um, and a um, actually what's turning into a, an absolutely gorgeous autumn. Well, um, there is still a pandemic. Um, you might have um, noticed that um, I'm looking at the news and um, those of us who have been traveling um, there, um, know that um, uh, um, COVID is still around despite the multiple vaccines that at least most of us are, um, are carrying around with us. Uh, long COVID is an issue, and we didn't feel that it was safe at this time to uh, bring everyone together and ask um, you all to travel actually a significant um, uh, distance. Actually, I think the the most important issue is this middle one, which is that um, we found that when we run the virtual meetings, we get a much broader audience breadth in terms of geograph geographical distribution and also the types of institutions that are represented. And so um, while we absolutely um, in, um, uh, really enjoy uh, being together um, and having um, deep conversations, um, long, you know, often long into the night about uh, the details of file formats and other incredibly important things. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, not not all of us have the privilege or the ability to travel the long distances, and so using this format um, seemed a best way to uh, engage in some of the issues that we wanted to um, um, uh, that we wanted to address in these meetings. And the final issue is this: um, I wasn't exactly sure how to um, express this, but um, I think when we started this meeting way back in, I think it was 2006. Um, the OME meeting was one of the few places where the um, the dedicated, um, you might call them geeks or the informaticists or the people who really wanted to work on these um, kind of vexing um, um, uh, problems in um, biological imaging data could get together and talk about what they're doing. Um, it's one of the few places to talk about metadata specifications, et cetera. That is certainly not true in 2022. There are now a lot of different forums for, uh, for doing that and a lot of different um, projects working on that problem, which is fabulous to see. Um, and so we felt that there was, there's plenty of um, opportunities for discussions, presentations, et cetera. We don't, you know, you know that's great. We really wanted to focus on the specific um, technical problems that are, um, that we need, that we think we need to solve and so, and, and, and focus on those. That isn't, um, I want to emphasize, we're not trying to in any way um, cut out anyone. Um, many of the, the topics that you'll see um, mentioned in this presentation and, and the following sessions, there's an enormous amount of information available online. And if you have any questions, do get in touch. I'm sure um, any members of our team, um, the Glencoe team or others would be happy to um, bring you up to speed if you have any, um, if, if, you know, if you need sort of a quick introduction to what's what's going on. So um, it's just very we want we want the meetings to be very practical and focused on, um, if possible, getting work done. So that's why we're having a virtual meeting. I hope that's okay. If anyone has any comments, fire away in the chat, or if you you know, if you want to um, hit us up on Twitter, we're sort of trying to keep one eye at least on the open microscopy. Um, uh, Twitter, so um, or or elsewhere, um, we're not even going to get into the question of Twitter, at least in this presentation. If you want to bring that up later, we can. Okay. So, um, without further ado, um, I'll just uh, kick off here. Um, give you a quick quick intro to OME, and then um, quick update to what we've been doing. So, I've been using this slide now for I don't know how long to introduce the project. Um, and so several of you have seen this, but um, um, imaging, you know, just uh, just to bring everybody sort of to the same starting point, imaging is everywhere. We all know that 
that is used throughout the life and biomedical sciences for um, to, to take spatially and temporally resolved measurements of biological and biomedical systems. Um, incredibly powerful. Um, if you get into the details, amazing dynamic range and sensitivity, often noise um, um, noise levels that are Poisson limited. So, in fact, our detectors are working at the physical limits um, of our systems. It's actually a pretty incredible technology. Um, we are now all making measurements at scale, and we do so quite routinely. It's quite common for labs to generate tens to hundreds of gigabytes um, in an afternoon, if not more. Um, so, um, you know, it, it really becomes uh, the, the measurements that we're making become a, a challenging problem in and of, in and of themselves. How will, how will you handle, how, you, how will you uh, manage them, um, share them? And ultimately, uh, make them a, a resource, P perhaps um, uh, publish that data, perhaps just share within a lab, um, perhaps um, work together with a, in a collaboration. And so those are really the problems that we've been working on for these 20 years. And it's a little, um, it's a little hard to say we've been working on the same problem for 20 years. Um, hopefully, we've made some progress, and we'll talk about that. But um, that does give you a sense of the scale of the problem. I think one of the things that intrigues me at least is, and I think several of us on the project is, we keep making progress, but the problem keeps moving um, beyond us. So um, certainly fun to work on. So why is this, so maybe a, by way of introduction, just um, addressing this question, why is it important to work with this um, data in the first place? And so this is just one, one um, illustration of that. This is a whole slide image from the um, Cancer Genome Atlas um, produced by the National Cancer Institute in the United States. And this is an h &E stain of adrenal um, adenocarcinoma. And so these images are now quite common. And this, you know, this could be one of many different modalities and many different um, experimental domains. Um, just picking this because it's, it's a sort of visually powerful example. Obviously, zooming up on some sub subregions, you can see um, cells and uh, nuclei. And it's very common to run some kind of um, segmentation or feature extraction tool to define, in this case, for example, the nuclei and the cytoplasm. Obviously, um, we can then um, generate various um, derived features from um, that um, 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 those segmentations and use that, for example, to uh, to, to uh, understand what um, the, the details of what is going on um, in, in this case, in this tissue, or for example, in cultured cells, or, or for example, in time-lapse sequences, et cetera. So it's this conversion from this image into quantitative measurements um, that's so important and why um, we are, um, you know, all of us are involved um, in, um, uh, in this project. Now, the fact is, is that to do um, to do that that um, that process that you see on that slide to run through this process with one image doesn't is isn't anymore at least that challenging, but it's when um, uh, you start thinking about um, scale and the um, and the uh, scope of what we have to do with this data that this idea of working in, at, in an informatics problem becomes so important. So. Um, many of you know these data are not, for example, just 2D, but five-dimensional um, signi of, of significant size into the terabytes. There's a comparison here to your standard 4K Net Netflix video, gives you some idea of, um, of context. Note that the amount of data you know, associated with a single phase three trial, that's just one way of thinking about this, is in well into the petabytes. Um, um, several labs talk about the fact that their PhD, you know, an individual PhD will generate tens to maybe hundreds of um, terabytes of data. It's not just this binary data. This is the bigness that we talk about, and that bigness is a problem. But um, uh, the metadata, the access um, mechanisms, et cetera, all of which are very important. Obviously, lots of um, hundreds of formats. I want to. Um, highlight that what this slide is not trying to do is in any way um, state that there's anything going wrong with the file formats. I think they're actually, the, the, the commercial vendors who produce um, an enormous amount of, whose systems produce an enormous amount of the data that we work with, um, um, uh, you know, the formats that they're generate they're, they're using are actually designed for specific purposes, and that's, um, that's fine. And Janina, Janina is now drawing all over my slide, so I'm um, not sure if I can if I could clear that. But um, 
Uh, Janina, if there's anything you want me to change here, just let me know. Um, in any case, uh, um, one of the problems is, is that, uh, you know, the, the file formats that are coming off of these um, imaging systems are, aren't really uh, designed for the scalable and uh, the large scale analysis that we need to do. Obviously, the field's moving um, rapidly, um, and um, um, and we need a lot of flexibility to handle the different types of workflows, et cetera. So, for all of those reasons, and let me see if I can clear the annotations. Clear all drawings. Gina, is it okay if I clear your drawings? I hope that that's okay. Um, I will do that. Um, let's close that. Um, okay, so. Uh, OME has been working on this problem of building um, interoperability tools or interoperability um, uh, specifications and software across all of the different functionality that you see on this slide. Um, so we're not, for example, the ones that build the great new imaging systems or the great new um, uh, artificial intelligence uh, models. But in fact, you know, our aspiration is, to, is to connect these different uh, tools together so that um, uh, new imaging modalities can be addressed by existing analytics um, and um, conversely, a, a, you know, a new analytic tool can address the wide variety of different um, 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 imaging modalities that, um, are that are available. And so it's this focus on this interaction, um, these um, interfaces, these um, APIs, interoperability, these are all words around this problem that is really um, what the project has been focusing on for some time. So um, just a brief brief um, survey or sort of summary of um, the work we've been doing now for um, over two decades. Um, so these are all these are all names of OME's software products or specifications. Um, um, Google will um, if you have, if you need more information about any of these, most there's several published papers, et cetera. All of these are available um, on um, um, online. Start off with a data specification, move through file for formats, database systems, data publication systems. In the case of IDR, at a new, at our latest work on this NGFF um, structure, a new file format for um, modern bioimaging. So just to sort of start to put these all together and, and have you some idea of how all of this all works. So many of you have, will have um, at, in your um, research centers, in your labs, um, uh, imaging systems, uh, probably in a facility um, where that are you know, pushing out large amounts of data that's written onto some sort of institutional um, uh, data store of some kind. Um, and you know, there the files sit. And so the key to understanding what OME is doing is this, is this idea of um, interfaces. So I mentioned bioformats. Bioformats is a um, file format translator. It takes, it provides a sort of single point, act, single point of access, a single interface to the many different file formats that are coming off of these many different imaging systems. A lot of people work with bioformats inside lots of different software, um, uh, Fiji, um, and, and many others. Um, we then uh, take, on top of bioformats, we would take Amero, so a data, a data management system that is using bioformats to read all of the metadata, the binary data, but store all of that data in various ways that are convenient and provide um, organization and interaction. A word that Chris Allen uses often, often is, is registration. Um, and so again, more interfaces into uh, many different um, data structures. Um, with that, then it then becomes possible to to have um, uh, to, to bolt on, for example, uh, teams of, of users, collaborators. Because we're storing all the permissions, we can control that access between those different um, between those different roles, and obviously um, connect into various analytics, um, et cetera, at at a variety of different scale. And you're going to see examples of that over the next um, hour and a half or so. So um, that's sort of how we see the world. I want to emphasize that you know this is a way of thinking about working with data that involves these interfaces, et cetera, as opposed to working with the raw data, for example, sitting on a, on a large file store. These interfaces um, provide an abstraction, um, and hopefully, um, when you're, especially when you're working at scale, um, provide a lot of value in terms of the, um, the organization and access control 
as well as the scalability. Okay, so just to show you what that looks like, sorry, let me just orient you. So imagine that you know I'm up here with my laptop connecting into an Amaro system. I'm gonna show you screenshots of Amaro running. You have to imagine that this whole slide or all of this architecture sitting underneath. Um, uh, so this is a screenshot of Amaro and bioformats. This is um, high content screening data. This is from the Broads BBBC um, uh, resource. So this is multi-well uh, data. And that um, these images, um, these are obviously um, cells growing in culture on a multi-well dish. And these images have been processed with cell profiler. Um, and so the analytic outputs, the analytic metadata um, for from cell profiler is, uh, is available, it's all integrated here as well. So the same application, in fact, as it turns out the same resource, we can point that to whole slide imaging data. And note this is TCGA data, so it has a lot of metadata associated with it. Um, and so we have a different metadata um, uh, um, structure here. Um, these are actually um, uh, metadata from um, calculated features from the images um, that, that I think are uh, published on the site. And then here is DICOM data, again, with DICOM tags stored as metadata inside of Mara. And so I'm breezing over all the technical details, but the key point is you have bioformats pointing at many different um, imaging uh, uh, data formats, and then a marrow managing those different metadata in various ways and presenting it in a common um, in a common um, a model. Um, we interop. We can extend interoperability to analysis, and these are some of the examples of tools that um, you can bolt onto a marrow. There's open source and commercial tools, and um, we we've, we've done a lot of work on this, but. Um, uh, uh, Jean-Marie uh, Burrell and colleagues have, um, have been pushing out um, guides for bolting on these various um, analytics. This is part of our um, efforts towards um, training and um, outreach, which I'll talk about um, later in the end of the talk. Um, and you can find more about, uh, more about that in that URL at the bottom of the slide. Okay, so we built all that. What happens? Um, so um, these are just a few um, published papers. These are papers that you know we certainly don't know anything about until they come out, um, and they're citing our work. But you know, there's just I just picked um, some um, uh, a, a few examples of, of of these different types of publications to give you some idea of the breadth of implementations of Amaro um, uh, based on various measurements. We think there's a um, a few thousand Amaro installations running worldwide. We don't know much about what they're doing. It's fair to say because we don't have a lot. We don't we don't track what people are doing, given that it's an open source project. Um, but um, uh, certainly, um, the software is contributing to a large number of um, 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 critical publications um, for the um, um, uh, for the biomedical and bi um, life sciences research communities. Um, I want to highlight that, in fact, there's a large there's an increasing and in, um, um, a really exciting uh, set of communities building up around Amaro. Uh, this is a YouTube video that was um, um, uh, produced by uh, Sophie um, Abalane at, um, uh, at Cote d'Azur, and um, you know gives you a sense of you know this is uh, these are videos targeting users in Sophie's facilities, and it's um, uh, it's great to see. Um, uh, the extension, uh, the extension of ideas about how to communicate with users um, based on our software, and there's several other other examples of this that you can find, for example, online on YouTube. So um, it has been over 20 years, <laughs> um, which is a little, as I said, is a little bit daunting to think about. Um, so first of all, I just want to um, highlight um, the team that um, has made has made everything uh, here possible. These are the current members of, of our team. And I just wanna pass a huge thanks to everybody that's involved in making the software, first of all, available, but also um, supporting um, the community. Many of you will, um, you'll have known, um, you've seen uh, various names um, uh, on Image SC and elsewhere. And so I uh, was, you know, huge, very, you know, grateful for all of the hard work um, that goes on um, with, um, uh, with the OME project and this team, as well as a large number of other former team members who have gone on to other positions. Uh, their names are on our website. Several different collaborators um, in institutions um, uh, in uh, Europe and the United States and in Japan, 
and we're very um, glad to um, have the opportunity to work with um, all of these. So, you know, the product of all that work, um, since our last um, meeting, lots of different releases. Um, some of them are point releases, for example, in bioformats, so where we're making, uh, you might say, relatively minor, but still important adjustments in the file formats readers. Some of them are security releases, and you see those there, and that's, you know, um, all credit to the team for um, taking those seriously. And as you can imagine, when uh, such a thing happens, um, uh, when we when we were we become aware of a security and vulnerability, it's sort of an all hands on deck um, uh, moment when we have to you know, uh, change what we're doing, address these problems, um, uh, get everything um, sorted out, and then run through a, a well defined but absolutely cl critical process. So thanks to the team for all of this work and all the different um, uh, and all of its different forms. Um, and so. Um, just to kind of um that's mostly what i wanted to say today just to just to um kind of finish up by saying where is oemi's focus going to be and you're going to hear about part of that focus in the image data resource this is our uh, public data public um imaging data um uh, resource that we've built at um embl ebi and so francis wong is gonna um come in here and tell you uh, more about that in a second a lot of work on OMI and, and NGFF, and then Josh Moore, Jean-Marie Burrell, and Chris Allen are going to lead um, uh, discussions about the various aspects of that um, uh, over the next few days, and you'll, you'll hear about that. Um, I'll come back after um, um, Francis is done and talk about training and outreach, and then after, once I'm done, then we'll hand over to the Glencoe team. Um, we'll tell you more about that in a second, and they'll talk to you about what we, we've been doing. So, um, I don't see any questions in the chat. Anything urgent um, uh, anybody wants to raise? I have like, I'll count to like five, raise hands, chat, et cetera. If not, I am going to hand over to Francis and allow Francis to give you kind of an update of what we've been doing on IDR. Francis, all ready to go? Yep, there you are. Yes, thanks, Jason. Can you hear me okay? Excellent. Okay, so yes. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Francis Wong. As Jason mentioned, I'm going to give you an update on what IDR has been up to for the past 12 months. So for those of you new to IDR, IDR is a public image resource, and our vision is to work towards making image data generated by the scientific community publicly available and reusable via image archives and databases. IDR has been working to achieve this goal by making our image data publicly accessible at idr.openmicroscopy.org. Working with reference data sets, which are complete data sets containing molecular and functional annotations that are associated with an existing or upcoming publication. By integrating studies or data sets with other data sets, such as through genes, compounds or phenotypes. Having curated metadata and enabling data reanalysis via the cloud. IDR currently has 32 million image files, over 89,000 genes and 40,000 compounds. This amounts to 335 terabytes of imaging data. And since the start of 2019, the data volume growth has been about 75 terabytes per year. But in reality, this translates to over 110 um, studies cross-published in different journals and cross-referenced via accessions and DOIs. So now let's have a look at some imaging data. Here are a few cell and tissue studies to give you a taste of the types of data we have in IDR. Starting at the top left with this data set from the Human Protein Atlas, published by Yulin et al. Under IDR 43, you can see high resolution human tissue sections where protein expression has been mapped across all major tissues and organs in the human body. This is one of the largest data sets in IDR, measuring over 145 terabytes in size. We currently hold 11,000 antibodies from the Human Protein Atlas, which is about a third of the total antibodies we expect to receive. So this is a growing data set in IDR where we will release additional antibodies in batches. IDR also has several light sheet microscopy datasets, ranging from 1 to 10 terabytes in size. One example is IDR44 on the top right, which is a study mapping cell fates in the mouse embryo. 
This dataset is a reference dataset submitted by McDowell et al. It very nicely captures mouse development at the single cell level. Moving down to the bottom left, IDR47 is a yeast single cell transcription profiling dataset from Gregor Neuer's lab. The goal of the study was to generate datasets for single cell transcription modeling. And moving across to the bottom right, IDR94 is a large scale drug screen on human cells to identify inhibitors of SARS-CoV-2 by Ellinger et al. at the Fraunhofer Institute. So IDR has recently received a few multi-omics datasets. We published IDR123 earlier this year. This is a multicolor iFish dataset showing simultaneous visualization of DNA loci in single cells by Mota et al. The submitters also provided 3D coordinates for nearly 10,000 fish dots, and IDR worked with the 4DN community to use a standard fish omics format for this dataset, such as Spot ID, Chrome Start, and Chrome End. Another example of multi-omics data in IDR is IDR 101. Here we have an in situ genome sequencing dataset of human fibroblasts by Payne et al. These images show the spatial localization of hundreds to thousands of DNA sequences in individual cells. You can also download the sequence metadata as a table for each cell, and this greatly enriches the dataset and allow users to reuse this data for their own purpose. In fact, this is exactly what happened. Jama and his group accessed this data from IDR and used it in their new clone browser to show an example of interactive navigation of in situ genome sequencing data. New clone browser is an interactive multimodal data visualization platform for 4D new clone research. This has recently been published in Nature Methods for anyone interested in finding out more about it. So we at IDR were delighted when we discovered that this data set had been reused in such a valuable way. And we hope that the scientific community continues to find valuable data sets in IDR and to reuse these for further scientific developments. Imaging data for all published studies in IDR is available for download using the SPARE protocol. And IDR's mission is to make reference image data sets widely available as possible. Therefore, the majority of IDR data sets are published under a CCBY license. The CCBY license allows anyone to copy, distribute, and adapt the work as long as credit is given to the creator. So IDR studies published under this permissive license allows users to share and reuse the data. So now I'd like to show you a workflow example of obtaining information from one resource and then coming to IDR to find image data related to this information. IDR published this example in Workflow Hub in this example, we start with the resource HumanMind. HumanMind is an integrated database of human genomic data where you can search for genes, proteins, etc. So you can find information from this resource, such as identifying genes of interest. Then you can come to IDR with your gene list, ask a specific biological question, and see the images in IDR for these genes. So an example question could be, which diabetes-related genes are expressed in pancreas? So to start answering this question, we obtain a list of diabetes-related genes expressed in the pancreas from human mind. Then we use the IDR multi-omics API to search for um, images in IDR associated with this gene list. And then taking PDX1 as an example, here you can see the IDR genes, IDR images linked to the PDX1 gene and we have images at four different developmental stages. These images are from IDR70 by Kerwin et al. Now we were able to retrieve these images from a search query as they have been annotated with a gene name and gene symbol. This leads me on to ontologies because a common question that people often ask us is, what ontologies should I use? We don't have a definitive answer for this, but I can tell you the public ontologies we are using in IDR. So for organism, we use the NCBI taxonomy. For study type, high content screen types, and protocol, we use the EFO. For imaging method, we use the FPPI. And for phenotype, we use the CMPO. For gene, we 
we use either Ensemble or NC Biogene, and for protein, we use Uniprot. Recently, IDR has been receiving more clinical data and compound screens. So we have been using StoMed CT for clinical data and PubGen for compounds. Now this is a list of the types of metadata which IDR can provide links to, and this in turn creates rich data sets with added value for our users. Now let's have a look at the IDR homepage. We have made a few changes to it this year, and we hope you like them. So one change is the addition of the image panel. It shows a thumbnail for each study in IDR. So there are currently 114 thumbnails representing the 114 individual studies. And when you click on a thumbnail, you'll see a pop-up window for the study, like this one for IDR 118. The pop-up window provides direct links to different aspects of the study. So if you click on the eye icon on the top right-hand corner of the image, it will open the image in the IDR image viewer. And from here, you'll be able to view all images of this data set. Or you can access the image files and metadata for the study by clicking on the number of experiments, in this case, one experiment. If the paper for the study is published, the authors will be shown in blue, as shown here for Keenan et al. And this will take you directly to the publication in PubMed. If the authors are greyed out, this means the paper is not yet published, but the link will be updated when the paper is published. The most recent change to our homepage is a search box where you can now type in a term without um, selecting a search field. So for example, if you simply type in PACS, the search will auto-populate the best matches to this term. And then you can select to see the images for PAT6, PAT7, etc. Apart from the ease of just typing in um, your search into a free text box, we've made this change because behind the scenes, we have been working to improve the functionality and performance of search for IDR. So for example, search is now more responsive and gives results much faster. However, this is a work in progress and we will be rolling out incremental changes over the coming months to continue to improve search for IDR. This brings me to the end um, for this year's update. But for those of you who'd like to submit data to IDR, this slide shows a brief overview of the data submission process. If you have a reference data set you'd like to submit to IDR, first step is to send an email to idr at openmicroscopy.org. Once we confirm your data set is a reference data set suitable for IDR, we will ask you to upload the original raw image files to us. You will also need to fill in metadata templates. And when all checks are passed, the data set is scheduled for release and then published in IDR. So now to quickly summarize, the IDR is publicly available curated studies submitted by the community in a searchable scalable platform that links metadata and enables reanalysis that can be deployed by others. This just leaves me to thank our funders and everyone on the IDR team. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Um, any immediate questions for Francis? We'll have, obviously have a discussion later, but anything burning, hands raised? Chats, etc. If not, going to uh, keep moving through here. Okay, so um, Francis has told you about the IDR. Um, this is running at. Um, European uh, Bioinformatics Institute uh, at their embassy platform. So the cloud-based uh, resource they provide as a collaborative resource. Uh, we're very grateful for um, um, that provision. Uh, obviously, IDR is a uh, you know is an instance of bioformats and a marrow that we've tailored um, to this problem. So, uh, uh, for example, data, uh, uh, sorry, specifically data uh, publication. Um, very happy. There's papers published on that, but very happy to ask uh, or address um, other. Aha. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> I know, Peter. It's it's a glitch in the matrix. Anyway. Um, okay. So uh, 
uh, Francis has shown you the URL. Um, you obviously can um, work with it there. I think the one thing I wanted to point out is, is that we see the IDR and definitely we've been working for several years with our um, colleagues at uh, EMBL EBI. Uh, we see the uh, uh, IDR as part of this um, bioimage ecosystem. So as I think um, Francis indicated, a lot of um, annotation and curation to make added value resources to um, reference data. But um, on the other side, sort of the, the repository or archive for um, uh, bioimaging data being built at, uh, at EBI um, and a project run by Matthew Hartley is the um, bioimage archive. And so we've been working with them um, uh, behind the scenes and, and certainly in various training or workshops together uh, to, to have these two resources uh, connect and um, share best practice, um, annotations, metadata structures, but also behind the scenes, file systems, et cetera. Um, it's not just us doing this. Um, so, you know, very excited to be part of a much a much larger um, effort that includes um, Shuichi Unami's um, team at Riken building sort of the analogous resources um, uh, in Japan, um, the SSBD repository and database um, system. So, um, we have we actually have a recent um, award for some more um, a collaboration with uh, Shuichi's team, and we're very excited to be looking at common metadata uh, mechanisms for these um, uh, highly curated data sets that Francis was talking about. Okay, so um, here's a question that sort of leads me to the final section of what I wanted to produce. Um, uh, sorry, I uh, discussed uh, today, which is you know there is this major. Uh, focus on FAIR data. So FAIR is findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. But if we don't have scientists who have the expertise to use the tools to, to, of this FAIR data, it doesn't really matter at all. And so um, I wanted to sort of bring up the idea that, you know, people have um, emphasized the importance of making data, you know, meet these criteria for um, uh, shareability, if you will. That's all very fine and well, but I think one of the things that we've seen in the OME um, project, and I think Chris, Emila, and Aaron might talk about this um, in the, the presentation you're going to hear from Glencoe, is that you know we really see this need to raise the level of expertise and knowledge um, in our communities, so to to make better use of the data sets and the tooling that already exists. Of course, we want to take you know all of our software and and applications. Um, uh, forward and, and advance them in uh, various ways, and that's fine. But it's pretty clear that even what we have today isn't always used as well as it could be by the um, by our user community. We, I, th I think, it's very important that we improve that. Now, for um, uh, in the in the in the times before um, COVID and lockdown, uh, Peter Volchesko, who's um, running the recording um, here. Um, was uh, well known throughout the world for his um, Amero workshops, and um, this is just, uh, this is Peter's um, um, places that Peter's been, sort of uh, maybe his uh, his carbon footprint, um, uh, um, and the and the training workshops that he's been running um, in various locations. And so this has been obviously this has been continuing, not in person during the pandemic, but uh, virtually. And so that's been very exciting. Now starting to pick up again in person. But I think um, uh, the um, the workshops and the interactions with users are um, has has have shown us how important it is to spend time with people one on one or in a small room with maybe um, a small number of users working through patterns, showing them how to set up workflows, working with their data, and actually you know bringing them forward and their capabilities forward um, to enhance ultimately their science. Um, I just want to highlight um, this. Uh, this is taken from a publication from the Bioimage um, Bioimaging North America um, group. This was published late last year, and so this is res results from their survey of the community. Um, uh, this, as I said, this is from BNF, so from the North American Consortium. Similar things have come out of German Bioimaging, France Bioimaging, etc. Um, I just thought it was very interesting that when you ask. Um, um, this cohort. So you might say, well, this is more on the US side. It may be, if you read the paper, they talk about, in fact, most of their uh, responses came through um, 
announcing the survey on Image SC. So that's really a worldwide um, network. In any case, um, you know, what do you think? Uh, what What do you think analysis tool creators should do to make the analysis better and more successful? So people talk about UIs, but notice documentations, tutorials, workshops, accessibility. So this idea of engagement um, with the community. What do you think? Uh, what do you think analysis tool users? Um, so, for example, people who are experimentalists, um, microscopists, could do to make image analysis better. Learning, tutorials, best practice, encourage, understand, share. So I think this idea of, engage, of, of engagement is really coming through in these surveys. That's probably something I think I can tell you from an OME perspective, it's something we want to involve and um, be involved in. We think, you know, we can have a long conversation and I think Chris and... Um, Aaron and Emil are going to tell you about ideas of advancing Amero in various ways, and that's great. But we think the tool is actually pretty good, at, at least pretty good now. And um, but we need to do a better job of of, of helping our users um, uh, access and use these tools. So um, that's really the end of this presentation. Just to um, highlight again the agenda, um, the next um, sort of um, so today um, we're doing OME and Glen Glencoe updates. Uh, Thursday, um, uh, leading a discussion about the how, how to how to view and interact with NGFF data. Um, next Tuesday, metadata, next generation metadata. And next Thursday, I'm talking about Java um, implementations. Again, the timings, and hopefully that's clear. Um, I'm going to stop there. Um, any questions? I need to. I can't see the chat. Yep, still nothing in the chat, which is great. I guess it's either been abundantly clear or we put you all so fast asleep that um, Frederick, maybe a general about data handling about as people from genomics and now producing images. Uh, here the vision is going to produce from one to five to uh, images, depending on the format. How could we easily deal with that? So the VisGen system is a Murfish system, if I'm not mistaken, um, Frederick. It's uh, the commercial implementation of Murfish. And so that's a basically a small molecule, um, um, uh, sorry, a single molecule um, fish imaging system. So I, I naively, without knowing an awful lot about it, um, we need to find a way to get the v, the the VZG or the VZG format supported in bioformats. Now it may be much more complex than that. There's a lot of different metadata there, but but for example, Francis has shown you various ways to think about. Um, um, storing um, geno the genomic metadata, obviously the probes, et cetera, um, and the probe maps and the barcodes and all that st stuff that's part of Murfish in Amaro. So um, at, you know, at the 90,000 foot level, that would be the answer. Um, does, that, does that address the question, Fabio? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So um, in particular, if you think VisGen System should be supported. Have them should be supported. Excuse me. Have them comment. Have them contact the Glencoe team to make sure to get that format um, supported in bioformats. Okay. Yeah. Um, any others? If not, are IDRs held tiles held statically. What? Um, <laughs> I can think of lots of ways to answer that question. Sebastian, do, do you, so I think the answer is yes, but it would be interesting to hear what Sebastian, what's your interpretation of that question, Sebastian? Uh, well, maybe Jimmy can <laughs> unmute and explain what he means by statically. Yeah, okay, that's probably the right way to do this. Yeah. Jimmy, tell us what you uh, mean by static. Um, so I was just looking at the, I was, I, I looked at the IDR and saw how it's sort of, uh, in the network tab, how it was grabbing images. It seemed to use a, a render image region, um, sort of method or something, uh, through, through, a, through a web gateway. Um, so I, I was just wondering whether those were sort of like brought to the user quickly or, or sort of somehow like generated from, um, you know, your, your next generation file formats or whatever. Sorry, yeah. pardon me. Yeah. So, so the latter. So when you hit these endpoints. The data is retrieved from the, uh, will be uh, in many cases retrieved from the original file format translated on the fly under the hood and then pre rendered uh, back to you. Uh, there are, uh, so that's going to be the case of most of the 
APIs, especially the ones which are rendering things. Again, we can talk more about the accessing them directly. Uh, that's probably for the larger question, but for most of the ones, uh, latter. Thank you. No problem. No problem. Any other? Any others? Uh, yeah, there's Sebastian's hinting about thoughts for how we might take IDR in the future. Maybe we'll talk about that over the next couple of days. Um, I don't see anything else. So if not, I'm going to take no more time away from Chris, Aaron, Emil. So Chris Allen, Aaron Deal, and Emil Rosbici from uh, Glencoe Software are going to take over now and tell you about what's been going on there. Over to you guys. Excellent. Thanks, Jason. Hopefully everybody can see that slides. Okay. Right on. Uh, so it's great to see you, um, here this afternoon. I'm going to do a quick introduction to our collaboration update. It's been a couple of years since we've, uh, done one of these. So it's, it's nice to, um, to go through this in a, in a little bit more, more detail. Uh, with me, I have the Glencoe Software leadership team, uh, Aaron, Emil, and myself, who kind of uh, manage our various applications, product, uh, and software engineering uh, efforts. And just from a sort of outline perspective, many of you know who we are, but um, for those that don't, I'll just go go through a little bit of who Glencoe Software is talk about the things that we've done uh, over the last 12 to 16 months, um, then give you kind of a preview of where we see things going, and then I'll hand over to Emil and Aaron for the more interesting stuff and screenshots and uh, a variety of um, product portfolio uh, things. So just quickly, who is Glencoe Software? Uh, we are the exclusive commercial partner of the Open Microscopy Environment. Uh, we have a pretty sizable team now uh, that is quite geographically distributed. So as far west uh, as the central United States and as far east as Poland. Uh, as far as our expertise is concerned, we have a wide cross-section uh, across a variety of different domains that helps us kind of deliver solutions um, that are increasingly diverse. And we have a established customer base uh, that is really worldwide and uh, that extends uh, all the way to Australia now. So that's kind of who we are as far as what we do. Uh, what we do is we leverage that commercial partnership to have a real synergy between what we try and do and what the open source uh, team has as part of its kind of agenda. And to do that, we build on top of that open source foundation to sell commercial licenses, customization, and you're going to see lots of specifics about that uh, from Emil and Aaron as far as domain-specific applications that we layer on top of the OMI platform foundation. And then increasingly, what's part of uh, what we do is that overarching service and support so that we can kind of deliver a all-encompassing uh, solution. Now, what you're going to hear a little bit from me and also from Emil and Aaron is an increasing level of interaction with the open source project and contributions back to the mainline and uh, evolution that we want to commit to. Uh, as Jason said, the, the platform's pretty solid now, but we have uh, different directions that um, we think are essential uh, and different uh, constituencies that, that we definitely need to serve. So um, as far as our uh, core products. Uh, we have our own version of Omero that has a series of extensions and uh, specific deployment criteria, which we call Omero Plus. Uh, that is sitting on top of the bioformats that we all know and love. Um, and then we have a series of domain-specific uh, visualization and analysis tools that sit on top of that platform. And the most uh, significant one of those in the digital pathology domain is called PathViewer. As far as how we deliver a solution, 
pretty much everything we do is is very image centric. We have the images at the center of all of uh, the things that we try to do, uh, both from a data modeling and information architecture point of view, but also how we approach the solution and the people uh, who really interact with, with the platform and the tooling and with our team. The two main domains that we operate in are high content screening and digital pathology. And in high content screening, the, the types of people are are slightly different, but the, the concepts are the same. It's trying to bring all the components of the organization, be it an academic one or a commercial one or a biotech and biotech or pharma. Uh, again, trying to bring all those different people to the table to deliver on the solution because you can't just have one part of this in order to try and affect the scientific process in any way. Um, so we're trying to bridge the gaps between these people using the platform, but also using the staff that we have. Uh, Digital pathology is no different. The names of the people are slightly different and some of the uh, keywords are slightly different, but the general concept is the same, trying to bring all these things together and bring this technology to bear on uh, a significant um, problem space. So what did we do over the last sort of 12 to 16 months? Or firstly, what did we promise that we would do? Uh, fundamentally expand OMI and GFF in, in a series of ways, most focused on geometry and analytics. And you'll hear some specifics about that from Emil and Aaron. Uh, we know that OMI and GFF is not potentially uh, particularly useful to the community without tooling. So uh, we need to commit to those things, both in terms of the conversion platform and also in the server side capabilities. Uh, and we need to demonstrate that this platform actually does something uh, to for an end user that we can build applications on on top of that foundation. This is kind of a timeline of a whole series of endeavors that we had both open source and commercial over the last uh, sort of 16 months here. I'm not going to go into the details of all these. You'll hear about some specifics uh, from Emil and Aaron, but suffice to say we've done a lot this year um, and you know worked on a whole series of different uh, components. As far as uh, some specifics, just for me at a at a high level, uh, we really tried to drive NGFF in a variety of ways, in particular the products around conversions of regions of interest and analytics from a variety of commercial tools. If you're interested in those things, you can uh, contact Aaron and, and Emil separately. I'm sure they'd happy, be happy to talk about them. Uh, some additional path viewer releases layering uh, technology on top of the platform that I mentioned. i uh, talked about already the extension of the conversion tools. Our versions of Amaro Plus are now shipping with native OMI and GFF support all the way through the platform. Uh, and we're continuing to, to evolve that and look at different ways uh, to handle object storage in particular. Uh, we're very lucky to have David Sterling on the team who was previously uh, part of the Cell Profiler core development team. And that's helped us kind of integrate uh, more NGFF things there uh, from a native perspective. Uh, we've expanded the team substantially. We're going to continue to do that uh, to try and you know evolve things in a, in a wide cross section of ways. Uh, and there really has been a commitment from the whole group on uh, trying to evangelize and talk about uh, OME technology uh, in a variety of different uh, environments that you know, OME as a whole doesn't necessarily have the opportunity to do. Try to get the message out there as, as much as we can. Uh, so as far as our kind of general directions and you hear more uh, specifics from Emil here just in just a second, um, we're really investigating those directions for compression. We know that uh, most of the community at the moment is focused on know, kind of classical fluorescence or electron, electron microscopy for the NGFF space. And that's, you know, one of the domains we operate in is digital pathology. And there's tons of uh, compressed data and a variety of different uh, compression schemes there. We need to address those things. We need to figure out how we're going to work with them in the context of uh, the next generation file format. And we want to continue to expand the capabilities of that. Uh, as I mentioned, we see our role as taking a more, you know, sort of active position 
uh, in both bioformats and Omericore development and trying to contribute things that we think are essential to, you know, bringing the platform forward. Uh, going to continue to expand the team. Emil's going to, uh, and Aaron are going to talk about the the sort of specifics of, of those people. Uh, continue that uh, evangelizing and communicating uh, OMIA technology in in as wide a form as we possibly can, uh, and then trying to bring our domain specific tools into brand new domains uh, and new structures there. So with that, I'm going to close down and hand over to Emil for the more interesting stuff. Thank you, Chris. Okay, let me try to share. Okay, so I'll spend a few more minutes to still show you guys some more bullet points, and then I'll hand over to Aaron for some interesting uh, application showcase where you can see some screenshots from our running applications and concepts and, and other things. So I hope that uh, that will be the exciting part to, to look forward to. Um, I'll spend the next few minutes just describing what we really mean by, by Omero Plus becoming the global data management solution and what pieces of technology we've put in place um, to make that transition actually happen. Um, it is not unusual for us these days um, that, um, well, we're, we're working with our customers, that the image acquisition processing and analysis does not really happen at the same geographical location. Um, so if Omero Plus is to become the global data management solution, it needs to provide interfaces and be able to connect the users and various teams and the data located at multiple sites. This is, this is really a must for us these days. We're observing a trend of shifting the data and the infrastructure to, to the cloud. So uh, we are really working uh, hard on making the change to, to become the cloud native um, deployment uh, with the object storage effectively as a first class citizen. So something that you can rely on with every deployment. Um, one of the most important part is Omero becomes the conduit for, for all this interaction with the, with the data really, and not only by the end users directly, but also by the third party applications, we really must provide new authentication and authorization workflows. Um, this includes single sign-on um, capabilities, but also things like application access tokens. So um, we can work, for example, over REST or HTTP APIs. Uh, our goal is really to provide a truly modular architecture, which, which then can fulfill those, uh, those requirements. So provide multi-site deployment, the required scaling, uh, and the global access capabilities, no matter where the data really is. There are some challenges, of course, in, in, in providing a global data management solution, because what does this really mean when, when we have the data and the teams distributed? Well, we need to integrate with the image processing tools better because we can't really shift the data between the sites. It should be analyzed where it is, even though the team might be somewhere else. Um, that means not only providing the access to the pixels and, and to the image data, but also um, including the, the metadata exchange, creating the masks and the label images, um, uh, handling and, and processing of the analytical uh, results as well. It's, 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 an, it's an absolute must and a challenge that, that we're currently facing. Um, integrating the visualization and data mining tools in our interfaces is another, is, is another difficult problem to solve. We know that we, we can produce quite easily during segmentation the volumes of data that are equal or greater than, than the original raw image data. So it's exactly the same problem. We need to provide similar interfaces to our visualization tools for working with, with the analytical data at scale. That will then take us into modernized, uh, pluggable uh, infrastructure and architecture for the novel data applications, and will allow us then to propose tailored solutions for our key domains. And, and as Chris said, those are at the moment, high content screening and digital pathologies. These are, these are the two, two really domains we're thinking about, and we would like to provide uh, full vertical solution, and I'll describe this in a second, what that, what that really means. So in 2022, we have set the foundations for all the work that will happen in the next, let's say, 12 to 18 months. We've started by setting the first stones kind of for, for turning Omero Plus into a truly cloud-native solution first. Um, we've added object storage support. So as Chris said, we already can work with the object storage natively. 
and we and for that we use of course next generation file formats. Uh, we have added new authentication capabilities uh, for single sign-on interactions that includes SAML and OAuth protocols. So all the Omera Plus comes now with, comes now with with a new way of of providing off um, to the system. We have also built the workflow and processing engine. Uh, that, that's, that's one of the problems we are, we are currently dealing with most of our um, applications where we need to provide ways of stitching, converting, importing, segmenting, and ingesting the third party analysis results into the system, not necessarily from the client computers, but doing all of that on the back end on some schedule or maybe user user initiated process, but all of that needs to be handled um, on on our infrastructure. I don't mean um, Omero server per se, and that this will run next to the Omero server, but it needs to happen somewhere where the user doesn't have really control over the infrastructure. So we have introduced the uh, background task and the queuing processes. We have distributed workflow and processing engine that can run on multiple instances, providing. Um, uh, this this pilot workflows. This is already running in production. A couple of our installations, and we used containerization technologies for for easing up the deployment. Uh, that includes Singularity and Docker for uh, specifically image segmentation, conversion, and stitching um, that we do at scale. So these are the things that we've already done. Uh, they are already running, as I said, in the production. And we're now in the next months uh, completing the uh, 2023 kind of transition of Omero uh, Plus cloud native solution uh, with the support for generation three of OME and GFF. And Aaron will give you a little bit more detail about what this actually means and why is this so important. Uh, we'll bring in broader support for token based authentication that will become um, very important when we speak about having Omero Insight also to use the same authentication methods for SSO, HPC um, cluster utilities, so high performance computing cluster programs uh, and software, but also command line tools, APIs, and other things need to find a way of, of interacting with our system with this new authentication um, based processes. And what this really means is bringing in the foundation for the token-based authentication for Omero microservices, which will allow us then to, uh, to, to have a fully uh, modular architecture and have the Omero microservices run standalone without need to communicate with the server, which obviously will directly impact how we can scale the uh, applications and, and where we can place them and, and where the data needs to be with respect to, um, to the installation. Uh, with the workflow and processing engine in place, uh, we have also, as usual, found new ways of actually um, squeezing out new functionality out of it. And uh, in the next few months, you'll see from us a little bit more talking about system and the background task monitoring. Our users really, especially with distributed uh, installations, the multi-site deployments, where you have multiple microservices running um, and communicating, you have multiple storages being attached to the server. That's that's pretty much uh, usual for us. We'll need we'll need to have dashboards and and user interfaces to monitor the data, monitor the core services, monitor the storage, monitor the network, and monitor the background tasks that are happening in the system to provide all of that information to the end user. With this foundation set, uh, I think we'll be very comfortable in building the tailored solutions for the key domains. This is kind of the, I guess, the theme we started with. We really want to provide the high content screening and digital pathology workflows that will allow us to provide cell and tissue phenotyping uh, directly from Omera Web, uh, object level data mining, the deep, deep learning and artificial intelligence model, uh, tuning and training, whole slide image segmentation and high content screening uh, plate segmentation at scale, as we already do some of it. And uh, I think Aaron will mention some of these tools uh, in the application showcase and finally reporting. So having all of this raw data is great, but actually to close the loop, we need to provide the tools that will allow you to, to summarize your result and produce a report and, and turn your images and the metadata and analytics into true knowledge. So. That's where I stop uh, and we'll pass over now to Erin for, for the application showcase. Great, thanks Emil. I think Emil. I need to stop sharing at the same time, right Erin? Because I will be stuck here forever, okay. Perfect, okay, so I'm gonna give a few examples of the products and technologies that we're hoping to advance in 2023 just to build on what Emil just described. So let's start with Omero Plus Cloud Native. As Emil mentioned, we are heading into uh, the generation three of our support of OME and GFF. 
So uh, in part, this means that we are evolving the functionalities and ways that we support next generation file formats. So a few new features listed there, things like multi-bucket support uh, for groups that are using object storage, flexibility in the credentials provider. So this is important for groups that are using different cloud providers, but also have various requirements for uh, data authorization that are institution wide policies. Um, and also improved import performance for particular domains that are particularly challenging on the import side, like high content screening. But it also means thinking about integrating NGFF into core server functionality. So beyond just, I have an image that I've already imported, that I've already converted to NGFF that I want to import, but instead thinking about how we can leverage NGFF as a technology in server side processes. So one example is the replacement of the pyramid generation process. And so you might be familiar with pixel data when you import flat data that doesn't have a pyramid. Uh, we already have a robust conversion tools, things like bioformats to raw to generate NGFF data. This could be one such replacement for that pyramid generation process. As Emil mentioned, we also want to broaden our uh, token-based auth protocols um, and our single sign-on support. So uh, we already have support for uh, SAML and OAuth in the browser when you log into Omero Web, but we want to extend this to other clients. So two Omero clients that we uh, mentioned as examples are Omero Insight and the Omero CLI tools, but you might also imagine uh, other third-party clients or even your own custom image analysis pipeline that's running on your HPC cluster. And as Emil highlighted, we're thinking about a global data management solution. And so this really importantly lays the foundation for a truly modular Omero microservices architecture. So think about those localized data services for those groups that are working uh, across continents. So Emil also mentioned uh, our workflow and processing engine. So this variety of server side uh, background tasks that are uh, being orchestrated now by uh, this workflow engine. And so with the increased complexity of things that are running server side, we thought that it was important to mature the Omero admin dashboard. So uh, what we're thinking for the 2023 Omero Plus admin dashboard is a, a, a tool to monitor both system usage and those background tasks. It would also include notifications and views for particular roles. So just to give a few examples, um, you might be an Omero systems administrator, you might receive notifications on storage or database issues, and you might want to monitor any running services um, on the server. You might be a data analyst instead. In that case, the background tasks that you might be interested in monitoring are your image processing tasks. So say you're segmenting 10,000 images and you wanna see how far in that process uh, you've gotten. You also might be a data manager. And so these data managers might be uh, in charge of uh, data imports to Omero, and they might be not only managing, uh, checking the background tasks for any automated uh, import process, but they might be managing import profiles. So uh, a profile for a particular instrument or a particular group that has an automated uh, data import workflow. They also might be monitoring both the current and historical system usage statistics across users and groups. And so here you see an example of uh, tracking the number of users or logins and the types of data that have been imported historically into the system. Um, and so collectively, there are these different roles that might use the Omero admin dashboard in different ways. Um, so providing a few uh, more interfaces, but also that notification system uh, for the monitoring purposes. Now, one of the processing tasks that we've been spending a lot of time on is, of course, image analysis, image processing. And uh, I think it was already mentioned that the scale of the results that you can produce with image processing are sometimes the same size as the original image data or even larger. Um, maybe a lot of people on the call have experienced that. And so uh, just as, as a more specific example, um, you might think about storing uh, this data in a table. And if you have, say, a single whole slide image or a plate from a screening domain, and you try and segment all the nuclei and cells across that collection, uh, you're typically talking about half a million to two million objects, which might be rows in your table. And then you might measure some things about those objects. So you might take morphometric or intensity or spatial measurements, and those might be the columns in your table. And you could easily have tens to hundreds of uh, those measurements that you're taking for every object. And so you can imagine how you know that's for maybe a single image or a single plate, so the scale can become quite large. So uh, currently, when we've uh, worked with our existing analysis integrations, we've been writing this data to Omero tables. Maybe some of you have, have already used this. Um, and 
thinking forward to 2023, there are a couple of ways that we want to change the core Omero tables functionality. So the first is that we want to allow both tiled analysis and visualization of these results. I'll show you a couple of examples of that um, in our existing interfaces. And so for that, Omero tables needs to support spatial queries. So give me the objects that are within this particular region of the image. We also know that this is a large volume of data managed in Omero tables. And so we might want a dedicated microservice uh, for serving the requests for that tabular data. This is similar to the way we think about serving requests for image tiles in a viewer. Um, similarly, you might want to, uh, you have a huge volume of tabular data and you want a dedicated microservice to churn out those tabular results uh, for the, the users or applications querying that data. And then finally, um, Emil mentioned the sort of modernization of the pluggability of Omero. And one example of that is the Omero Tables API. Um, we want it to be updated for those modern data science workflows. Um, we know that there is a rich Python toolbox for the, the modern data scientists. And uh, one example of a way that you could kind of ease uh, the, the developer process of integrating with uh, data in Omero Tables is uh, supporting, say, uh, loading your Omero tables into a pandas data frame really easily. And so that's what we mean when thinking about modernizing uh, the API for interacting with uh, data that's in Omero tables. Okay. So, you know, we want to be able to want to enable the end user to get their data out of Omero, but we're also thinking about ways that you can um, use our existing interfaces or new interfaces to mine through uh, this kind of analytical data. So I want to show you a few examples of that. So the first is in Path Viewer. This is a viewer um, that is developed by Glencoe Software. Uh, it's a commercial product. And uh, the functionality that I'll show you here um, was actually first uh, presented at the last OME community meeting. Um, and so that uh, is still on YouTube if you'd like to check out that previous demo. Um, but I'll show you a few uh, screenshots today of some existing data mining functionality that we have in Path Viewer. And so here uh, I have an image shown in grayscale. And what you can do today in Path Viewer is you can visualize segmented objects and their measurements overlaid with the original image, so within that tissue context. You can also filter color and group objects based on their features. And so here, just to zoom in a little bit, uh, we have these objects color coded by their area and we have them grouped into three bins, uh, small, medium and large. And uh, importantly, this visualization is driven by that analytical data, those object level measurements being stored in Omero tables. Okay. You can also visualize uh, summary heat maps if you want to have kind of a high level image overview of these analytical results. So what are the technologies that are being used for this visualization? So the first is OME NGFF. We're actually storing all of these labels and masks that you see overlaid with the image in that next generation file format. So it's completely compatible with object storage. We're using Omero tables for those measurements. And so with spatial indexing and the microservice for handling those large tables, we'll be able to really improve these visualizations, excuse me, in 2023. I also want to highlight that the image that you see here is from uh, the Orion instrument uh, that is coming from RareSight. Okay, so um, that example in Path Viewer is really nice if you're looking for um, cells or other objects in the tissue context, in the single image context. But we also want to think about, say, a rare population workflow or other mining workflows where you want an object-centered visualization. And so a new interface that we're developing in 2023 is Omero Pageant. This is for mining through object level data, and this would support your kind of cell and tissue classification workflows. And the motivation here is that you can explore your tabular data alongside those object focused image thumbnails. So you're out of that broader tissue context and you're focusing on the individual objects that you've found. And importantly, we need to, in this application, support both the single and multi-image context so that we can satisfy both the digital pathology domains and uh, high content screening. So a lot of the same technology is used in these visualizations. So again, we're using NGFF for the label images and we're using Omero tables for the object level data. But I also wanna highlight that in the bottom right-hand corner of this screenshot, uh, what you see is actually an embedded path viewer. So this is something that we've developed in 2022 that we're gonna release in 2023. Um, this is a JavaScript API that allows you to embed the center panel with ROI annotation tools that you're used to in Path Viewer in your other data application. And so we're using uh, this in a lot of our own tooling, but it's also available for embedding in your own custom data dashboard that you that you want to develop. 
Uh, we're also using the, the concept of those background tasks and tasks monitoring in this application as well. So you can think about those being important not only for generating the tabular data in the first place, but also doing uh, various processing tasks such as dimensionality reduction to allow you to um, visualize uh, this and, and mine through your data in this application. And then also just want to briefly uh, credit the image that you see here is from Jerry Turner's lab at Harvard Medical School. Okay. And um, the, the last new web interface that I want to describe here is Omero AI to come in 2023. This is an interface now for actually fine tuning that processing itself. So you might want to train your model, or maybe you have an existing model, but you want to fine tune some of the parameters and have fairly dynamic feedback on how that's affecting your segmentation. You might also uh, want to paint your pixels in order to provide the input for your model training. Um, and importantly, we are uh, planning to have uh, built-in integrations, which are actually already available outside of this um, Omero AI interface, but are already existing integrations that we've built in 2022 for the very popular um, uh, image segmentation models and, and uh, image processing platforms. So three that are listed there are Stardust, CellPose, and Cell Profiler, obviously being uh, more diverse than just image segmentation uh, image processing platform. And importantly, after you've done all this fine tuning, uh, you can actually submit your large scale image analysis job and, of course, monitor the, the status of that job. And a lot of the same uh, core technology stacks. So again, NGFF for those label images. Uh, we're going to be using those background tasks and tasks monitoring. And um, importantly, we have, again, the embedded path viewer as the, as the viewer there. And just want to um, credit the Broad Bioimage Benchmark Collection, which is the image that you see there in our screenshot. Okay, so collectively with all of these uh, new and updated uh, applications and functionality, we're thinking about ways that we can build domain tailored solutions. And so I just wanna give two examples, the first being in high content screening and the second being in digital pathology. So thinking about the high content screening domain, what's a kind of workflow that you could build across these various products? So the first is you might use NGFF, uh, this cloud native file format for uh, improved scalability in your image IO for your image processing tasks. Um, the image processing that you might be doing uh, might be through the Omero segmentation connector. I, I mentioned one integration that we already support is Cell Profiler. We're working uh, with the Broad uh, to the uh, progress on Cell Profiler 5, which should have things like support for OME NGFF as an input format, uh, compatibility with Cell Pose and Stardust for segmentation. And of course, they've classically supported um, com uh, core computer vision methods um, and other kinds of object level measurements like morphometric spatial intensity and population metrics. You then might use Omero Parade and Omero Pageant to mine through your data, both at the image level and at the object level. And you might also use Omero AI to fine tune uh, the parameters of your segmentation tasks and, of course, execute the segmentation tasks. Um, I wanted to highlight that we more or less presented this uh, domain tailored workflow um, at the SBI2 meeting recently in Boston, um, and the full poster is um, on our website. And so if you'd like to take a look at that, um, and of course, we'd be happy to answer any questions if you weren't able to see it at the SBI2 meeting. So for digital pathology, the workflows are, are similar, but there are some important differences. Um, so of course you're dealing with one uh, very large image rather than many smaller images. Um, and so in the diagram on the left here, you see, for example, this image being divided up into tiles and then those tiles being processed in parallel. Um, and one uh, use case for NGFF is the, the improved IO for that process. So being able to easily access those subsets of the image um, and be able to process those tiles in parallel. But we're also using NGFF for the outputs of image processing in the digital pathology domain. So remember those label image and mask overlays that we uh, showed in um, screenshots uh, of applications like PathViewer. For the Omero segmentation connector, um, you might use some other tools like CellPose, Stardust, or even your own TensorFlow model. Um, you might have even trained your own model in Omero AI, and that might be what you're using to segment the image. But similarly, you're going to use tools like Omero Parade and Omero Pageant to mine through your image level and object level results. And of course, you might use PathViewer to view all these results, not as uh, isolated objects, but within that uh, spatial context of, of the tissue. So to finish, I just want to step back and think about this kind of equation that I think we all deal with uh, in some parts of our lives um, as, as scientists or microscopists or data scientists. And that is that, you know, we have this terabyte scale imaging. So we have a lot of imaging data, but that's not quite the end of the story. 
uh, we need to combine that with various image informatics solutions in order to actually glean some useful insights from this data. And I think, you know, collectively at Glencoe Software, what we're offering is the expertise on, on both of those pieces, both the imaging side and the informatics side. And we use that expertise in order to build solutions that do exactly that, allow our end users to uh, get the most possible value out of their imaging data. Okay. And most importantly, I just want to say thank you for listening uh, to the three of us talk about the work that we've done at Glencoe Software. It's really great to share what we've done in 2022 and what we're looking forward to doing in 2023. Um, you can read more about us and, and keep up with progress on our website or on uh, maybe Twitter. And I uh, also wanted to highlight that if you are really interested in what we're doing and so much so that you want to do it yourself, um, we are hiring for two new positions. Those are listed on our website. And of course, uh, any of us are, are happy to answer questions about those positions um, and hear about why you might be interested. That's it. Thank you, Alan. Right. So that's the formal stuff done. Those are the presentations that we prepared. It's now time for questions from all of you or comments or really anything. Let me just make sure I can see hands. Uh, oh, yep. Um, so Ken is your expert for parsing Omero log files for user stats. Do you have any questions about that? He's he's your resource. Um, Mark completely agree that uh, you know arm wrestling Prometheus and Grafana, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is maybe not the easiest. So yeah, definitely thinking about doing a better job there. Um, any other questions, comments? Anything that you've seen? Wait, I don't see. Everybody would just want to move on with the day. <laughs> Everyone may need coffee again. We can take a quick break and come back. Shall we do that? Um, so that was a lot of information. Back to the question, Demir, okay. I suspect the answer is define easy, but I will let um, uh, Demir, but I will let Chris answer that question. <laughs> I don't think we have uh, at this point, any intention of changing our approach to how we deal with the microservices at present, uh, Demir? So uh, I don't think the whole team is, for example, deciding that they are part of the core uh, open source Omero and supported and uh, to the same level as all the other components. No, that may change, but uh, at the moment, no. Okay. Take uh, any other, uh, sorry, Matt. Uh, sorry, Katerina, I apologize. Too many places to look. So I think Katerina's first and then Matt. You're muted. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I mean, the you know, this stuff is absolutely amazing and probably the reason why people are not answering, asking questions because I mean, we know how fantastic and how much the amazing work you guys are doing. And it's amazing every year to see the progress. Um, you know, I want to, I mean, I, so it's not a question, it's more like a discussion that I've been trying to have in general, and maybe this is a, a one place where I can also raise it, is how do we make sure that all of the stuff that is you guys are doing is made available to um, to people that are actually still very much at the, like, it, people like me and people like uh, my colleagues that are very much at the, you know, um, prehistory of this. Uh, and no, I mean, this is, so I'm talking about myself. I'm not talking about anybody. It's not, this is not in any way being saying, being, it's, but this is the reality. So we need to push this expertise and training, obviously, and outreach is very important, but um, 
one thing that we've also been thinking through with uh, with bioimaging North America and all of these imaging communities, how do we, um, and also there was recently a, a um, workshop at, organized by the Allen, how do we raise, I mean, how do we convince people to, you know, the, the funding agencies to actually support this work so that we can build a, a Glenco, um, I mean, Glenco is serving a whole group of, of commercial partners and also universities that have the funding, but a lot of people don't. Uh, and so, and, and of course you have to support your work. So how, you know, the, the, the way out of this is, you know, uh, working together to, and, and obviously everything that Glenco is doing and you guys are doing is, is doing just that, raising the profile of what is possible. But I think the next step is really, uh, I totally agree with Jason that the, the, the tools are there at this point. At this point, we need to push them to the community and, and, and there is going to have to be some investment done. Um, so, you know, um, anyway, it's, it's not really, I, I don't know, it's not a question, it's not a comment, I don't know what it is, I'm just saying let's let's work together to actually do some, I mean, you know, you're already doing it, so I don't know, it's just, I don't know, I, we just need to be able to to have more funding in this space so that we can push this whole thing out to small labs, small core facilities, and so on, and you cannot obviously do it all on your own without any funding, so. Oh, Katerina, maybe I'll I'll just you know you make a comment to your comment, and which is you know, I completely agree. Um, that's why I kind of highlighted that training um, aspect there towards the end of the presentation that I gave. Um, I think, um, however, the life science, the life and biomedical sciences, got itself in the position where most of its scientists actually aren't quote aren't qualified data scientists. That I, I'm not sure how we did it, but we we've done it. <laughs> And we yep. need we need to do better, and um, uh, maybe just I'll make a very quick comment and then move on to Matt's question. But on the funding side, as we all know, almost all of our funding um, um, is um, uh, national. Okay, so you know you know OME's funding predominantly comes from UK based organizations. We had some EU funding, some NIH funding, but primarily. Um, uh, UK and you know we are trying to engage with our national community on that training topic. I'm sure you're doing the same as mentioned. I know uh, German Bioimaging um, just got some funding, uh, yeah, you know, and so on and so on. I won't, you know, there's just too many to list. So I think um, yes, Thomas, <laughs> um, you know, it's, and it's great to see. I should I should highlight the German Bioimaging's recent success with the uh, NF, NF, uh, NFDI4 for bioimage, I think that's just super, super terrific, right? So these parts are coming together. Um, I think the sewing together of these efforts is going to happen at our level just because most of the time funding is is national. So it's it's these forums and these relationships that will make that. So, uh, and so I should probably just shut up and um, hand over to Matt. So sorry, sorry for taking so long, Matt. No, it's grand. Um, I, I'm fairly new to the community um so i only kind of stumbled across it three or four months ago um so forgive me if it's a, a basic question but in the forums i was interested in um discussion around and data tables and i wondered how that kind of fits in alongside or uh the demerit tables that, that were mentioned in the talk just now it's a great talk by the way they've all been great Gosh, more, I think, wants to answer that question. So. Uh, the short answer is I don't have an answer. Um, we'll have to work towards a common solution. So uh, Omero has had its uh, solution in place for many years. It's been more or less used. And so Glencoe is, is working on it, trying to scale that and, and make it more generally useful. Um, the development of AND data in the OME and GFF framework is being led by kind of a, a separate group so and i don't think anyone from that group is here today someone should be uh present on thursday for the visualization um portion so they're working on a a plugin for napari and and the format itself and a python library um so this is a place that we will get ourselves and we'll have to ask you know how do we bring these things back together so you know to some degree they've they've somewhat forked um, I would hope that the layout of the file format is such that we can implement it in Omero 
regardless of what technology is being put in place. So that could be the HDF5 or SQL Lite or you know, whatever wherever we need to go to, to scale appropriately, we could still make the open source clients work with it seamlessly. That's the vision, right? Um, I think so. Kevin was actually Kevin who wrote the specification uh, was actually pinging me in the background saying, "Okay, are we ready for a review?" That should be opened up on Image SE, I would assume, in the next couple of days. By all means, pipe up and say, "Oh, and I want you know I want to make sure that it can be used with Omero." So voice these um, requirements, you know, to the rest of the community. I think these are all things we want to work on, but it will help if we can find people to to get their their hands dirtied with them, right? I don't know if the Glencoe crew wants to add anything to that, if they think it's possible or if it's even been looked at yet. No, I think the only thing I'd add there, Josh, is that, you know, it's certainly in our limited investigations here, I think, you know, especially for us, I'd be really careful with Python verticals, right? Um, or exclusively Python verticals. Um, it's not to say that they aren't effective, but we have a multi-language ecosystem here and pure Python verticals are um, can really work against us there. So um, we'll see how things go. I mean, we have to keep an open mind with everything that's going on. Thank you. Matt, does that answer the question for you? Is that what you need? Yeah, um, yeah, I'll keep an eye on the, the chat around it um, on the forum. Um, thank you. Sure, no Jason, um, you want to take the question from Damir on <laughs> US training <laughs> tours? So why hasn't Peter um, traveled to Portland yet, um, uh, Damir? Uh, the answer is probably you haven't invited him. <laughs> um, I, and, or you haven't offered him good food. That kind of yeah. goes hand in hand when it comes to Peter. So. Yeah. Um, He's gone this now, is, so I think we can talk about him, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, he's talking. <laughs> um, slightly more seriously, um, make no mistake, this is not um, some kind of uh, infinite generosity of, of some mythical funding body that sends us all, you know, all over the world uh, running training sessions. Uh, we have had a couple funding opportunities, for example, uh, training workshops in Okinawa and elsewhere, that, that, those were on that map. But actually, almost all of those are people inviting um, the team over and providing support for travel um, um, uh, and accommodation. And that's really the key thing: is you know, you know, our grant funding is really tied to uh, IDR uh, work, et cetera. We're trying to get more funding for for training, but you know, that type of travel. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't worry, it's not business class seats, et cetera. But you know, even that is, you know, it's not really in our budget. So, okay. So if 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 those of you who are interested in workshops, um, the team is running various remote and in-person workshops um in various places. I'm happy to do um <laughs> the chat is getting more entertaining. Um uh um uh yeah, just you know, get in touch. And that training support email address is where all of that is arranged and discussed. Does that address the question, um, Demir? Can't even find Demir. Yeah, yes, okay, there it is. Okay. Great, anything else? Not, I am going to have several people I think from Quite extreme time zones. So Horoya is from uh, Kobe. Um, um, yes, we were in. That's the thank you, Peter. We are in the U.S. So, um, any further questions? If not, maybe give you back fifteen minutes of your day in whatever time zone you're in. Um, wish you all. Well, um, hope to see you over the next um, several sessions. Um, uh, uh, it would be, um, I, th I think, well, the, the presentations will and the discussions will be a lot more um, focused. So um, um, look forward to that. And just say thank you again to um, everybody who presented and especially 